Hello, Team Healthy. How you guys doing? All right, I see you guys uh, on the live chat here. Just uh, saying all sorts of nice things to one another. I, I really appreciate who you are. Um, hey, you know, last time I mentioned to you that we were having a, a, a lot of people from all around the globe. By the way, did you notice that yesterday on my um, uh, on the uh, interview, sometimes when I do the uh, interviews, I put them up on Tuesday, we had uh, uh, Carolyn Strawson from uh, Hampton, uh, Northampton, England. So trying to go international here with our uh, interviews and all. And so I hope you, if you haven't seen that one, you will. She's a wonderful person. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I've been uh, picking up on some uh, uh, viewers from uh, Morocco and uh, Singapore and all over Australia. Uh, I mentioned Perth a couple of weeks ago. Man, everybody from Western Australia uh, started showing up and um, down in uh, South America, uh, Paraguay and, and uh, all throughout the continent of Africa. It, this is really cool what we've got going on here. So know that I so appreciate it. And, and those, there's, there's one from Canada. Uh, and uh, know that uh, wherever you're from, I'd like to know, and, and I know other people like to see where where you may be. So uh, just I hope that we can be encouragement, uh, encouraging to one another. Okay, today I've got some really interesting questions here uh, that I'm putting under the category of you improving yourself even when that narcissistic person won't reciprocate. Now. Not that we're going to put a total grading system on that, but um, narcissists, uh, if, if there's anyone that needs to improve themselves, they would be near the top of the list. And, and I don't want to say that to think, and I don't have to, because we all have the need to grow and mature. It's called the actualization process, where we're trying to become the person that we are ultimate, ultimately capable to be and that we are meant to be, which is goodness and decency and love, which is why I go with my mantra, DRC, dignity, respect, and civility. You know, that's what we're talking about when we have the improvement. And, and you look over that narcissistic individual and you might want to say something like, hey, I'm finding some things that are very helpful for me. I'm trying to make some adjustments that can be good for all involved. Would you like to join me? And the narcissist, they may or may not say it out loud, but it's like, mm, no thanks. Or even worse, it's like, oh, I've already arrived. I have hit the summit. I am right there at the top. You need to be more like me. And it's like, well, nobody ever hits the summit. Nobody's ever the, that perfect model. But uh, in a recent uh, video, I talked about how they have their uh, uh, idealism that just cannot be sustained. Uh, and and that's that's how they tend to think of themselves. And so as you go through the process of trying to have your own personal improvements, you look over there and say, join me. And it's like, no, it doesn't happen. And what's worse is many times they'll actually torpedo your good efforts or they'll try to keep you under and they try to declare themselves the winner. That's what we're going to be zeroing in on. We have multiple questions that are going to uh, to help us figure this out. OK. I know it can be kind of wearisome when you think, good grief, am I going to have to just uh, push against these individuals for the rest of my life? And why don't we say, well, push against, we can uh, uh, talk about that. But yeah, they're going to be there and uh, they're not going away. In fact, if anything, they may be growing. Okay, so let's, uh, I wanted to start with a comment that someone made because it kind of gives us an idea of what we're looking at. This person simply made the, and, and by the way, those of you who are new, uh, you, you can put your um, comment, your questions in the uh, the chat section here if you're watching live. Most of you are going to be watching on tape delay since we're in so many different time zones. Uh, but you can put your questions in the comment section and I'll, I'll pick up on them. Obviously, I can't answer every one of them, but uh, but uh, please know that, uh, uh, that I'm feeding off of your questions here. Okay, this first person makes the comment. My narcissistic brother always tells me that he's not condescending, but he's just accurate. Did, have I ever mentioned that narcissism uh, is uh, very heavily influenced by justifications and rationalizations? In other words, they're pathologically defensive. So this person says, you know, my uh, apparently his brother is just very condescending and always has to be right. And, uh, their opinion is the last one. And in a real smug kind of way, it's like, well, it's, it's, it's not bragging if you can do it, you know, that kind of thing. And it's not condescending if I'm right. 
And so to them, being the top dog is the ultimate indicator that you are a somebody. Whereas, no, not necessarily in a healthy uh, way of, of looking at relationships, being loving <laughs> says that you figured a few things out. Having empathy or being cooperative or being fair-minded, those are the signs that says you're, you're getting somewhere good. But the narcissist is like, well, I'll tell you what, what, uh, what my sign is. My sign is I'm right. And then if you ask, well, according to who, then the answer is me. <laughs> and so they pronounce themselves as being the, uh, the arbitrators and the standard bearers of all things that are right. And I want us to start with the assumption that even as you're trying to make your own personal improvements and you're engaging with that narcissistic individual, one of the things that keeps them from reciprocating with your good efforts is they have ridiculously low self-reflection skills. They have very poor insight. Uh, they use a lot of twisted logic and trying to keep themselves propped up. They're highly competitive. And so uh, having a sense of connection or um, a, a sense of coordination and harmony is not their goal. Being better than you is their goal. And obviously they have zero room for nuance. This person says, I'm not condescending. I'm just accurate. Well, let's take a simple illustration. Let's suppose you're discussing something about um, how to deal with a child that's that, that's acting up. And that narcissistic person can come along and say, well, I'll tell you what you need to do. Uh, you need to do A, B, and C, and that's work with my kids, and that's how uh, things ought to be. Uh, kids these days have problems, and if you'll just do exactly what I say, we're going to be just fine. Well, Every child is going to have a different set of circumstances. And in a, in a scenario like that, a one size fits all answer is not going to be a good thing. Uh, we need to slow down and figure out what the backstory is and what the circumstances are and uh, what that child's uh, temperament type is and all the rest. And narcissists like that, nah, I don't, I don't deal with that. In other words, no nuance. It's just like I have declared that's enough. That's what we're dealing with. And when you start with that kind of thinking, uh, learning and growing is one of the things that goes off to the wayside very quickly. So I just wanted to start with that. And I know that plenty of you have had people in your life who think that way. I'm not condescending. I'm just correct. <laughs> okay. In whose mind? All right. Now, this next question. How do you not yield to the narcissist and still gray rock? I feel if my uh, I, I feel if I voice my opinion, the backlash and verbal commentary is compounded. So here you have a person who it's like I don't want to yield to that narcissistic person, and apparently they've heard of that term gray rock. Those of you who are not familiar, gray rock just simply means that you get bland dull, um, neutral kind of responses. There's nothing more uh, bland and dull than a gray rock. And so if a person comes along and says, uh, I think you need to do this. And your response is, um, I, I certainly heard what you said. That would be a gray rock response. Uh, or if somebody says, I don't, I don't like the way you handled this. A gray rock, rock response might be something like, I'm aware of that. In other words, I'm not going to get into it. I'm going to acknowledge that I just heard what you said, and that's about as far as we go. And this person implies, well, I'm afraid that if I voice my opinion, and apparently even if I just do a gray rock comment, I'm just going to get a lot of backlash and uh, verbal commentary that's not going to be very pleasant. And to that, my, my response is, you probably will. And we want to ask the question, so what is the purpose of you going into gray rock in the first place? And the answer is not, well, I'm trying to get that person to act differently because that's, that seems to be the implication. I, I've tried to be gray rock. Hopefully they'll act differently towards me, um, but it didn't work. The purpose of going gray rock is not to get that other person to change. The purpose is to keep you disentangled from all of their, dis, you know, their ill logic. And so when they come at you with advice that you didn't need for or opinions that are ill-grounded, 
and, and you just kind of give a bland response, there's, they can still be very verbal and very condescending and insulting because that's what they do. It's part of their definition. Um, but basically it's like, well, uh, I've said all I can say. And if I go deeper into my commentary, all it's going to do is invite more insults and more unsolicited advice. And, and this is very similar to what I've talked with you about in times past about uh, why we set boundaries. One of the things that I hear from people is, well, I tried to set a boundary with that narcissistic person and it didn't work. And uh, my response would be, well, it all depends on what you mean when you say it didn't work. And again, we go back. If, if that person is still just as obnoxious and uh, uncooperative as possible, I set a boundary. They're still being uh, uncooperative and obnoxious. I guess the boundary didn't work. Your boundary is not for the narcissist. Your boundary is for yourself. And uh, basically it means that you're going to live according to what your common sense says. You're going to live according to the, the qualities and initiatives that you believe is wisest and best. And there's just the assumption, but I know that the narcissist is a not going to appreciate it. B probably try to trip me up and then C they're going to skip on uh, down the road in their own merry way thinking, boy, am I glad I'm not you. And, and so that's what they are. So it, it, there, there's so many times when we have to just pull back and regrettably acknowledge my growth efforts, my self-improvement efforts are going to be a solo job. Okay. And, uh, and, the, and so many times the narcissist can, uh, can uh, interpret you as being inappropriate or uh, very, being very um, uh, combative or contrarian. And my response is go ahead and interpret any way you want because it's predictable, whatever your interpretation is, it's going to be self-serving. I get it. I see it. I, I know that I'm not going to change it, but what I can do is I can continue on my path and uh, their carping and griping becomes background noise. And obviously this means that you'll probably need to have the least amount of, of close or intimate or sharing time with that person because it's so predictable that they just don't know what to do with it. Um, wouldn't it be nice if, uh, that, uh, that narcissist would say, you know, I realize that I, I've created a lot of problems here in this relationship, haven't I? And, and I, I really want you to help me figure this out. Wouldn't that be nice? And now how many of you can say, oh yeah, that's happened a lot of times with my narcissist. It's like, no, it, it doesn't happen because it's like, well, I'm pretty self-impressed. That's how they think. And so you can't tell me anything new. Okay. So your techniques are not for them. It's for you. Okay. Another question. And this is, uh, uh, I included this because this is such a, a common issue that many people deal with. This person asked the question, does the narcissist flip the script onto you when you call them out? And the answer is, Oh yes. For example, let's suppose that you might say something like, I've been trying to get you to help me out on this project and you seem to be very disinterested. Uh, let me know, you know, what is your intention? What would you like to do? So you try to call them out. And so they may come back and say, me, I'm not the problem here. You're the one that's not, that's, in, that's disinterested. You don't care about anything I say. And so they take whatever words you say and they just flip it right back at you. And you've heard me use the, the Aussie friends that we have. Uh, we call that uh, boomerang communication. Uh, they just uh, throw it uh, out toward you. And then uh, you throw it out towards them. They throw it right back at you. That's their boomerang communication. Narcissists have various techniques that they use when you try to call them out. One of the techniques would be uh, blame shifting. It wasn't me. It was something, someone else, or they'll do victim shaming. Um, you're trying to make me out to be the bad guy, but you're the jerk here in this equation. I don't know why I ever uh, bother with you. And so uh, they're victimizing you and they're shaming you for having negative thoughts about what they're doing. Or another thing that they're very famous for is projection. They'll see in you all sorts of problems that actually hurt what they are, but they don't want to deal with that. So they see in you what they can't come to terms with on the inside of themselves. And there are many others. But the bottom line is when you call out a narcissist and you say, hey, this is problematic or we could do better or I have needs that you're ignoring, 
one of the things that's part of narcissism is they refuse to take responsibility for who they are. These are entitled people. These are people who are selfish. They like to think of themselves as being, well, not just a notch above you, several notches above you. <laughs> and there's that haughtiness that they operate with, uh, even if they're more the covert inwardly, that's what they're thinking. And so by, by default, uh, whenever you talk about a problem that might exist between yourself and that person, well, it can't be me. That's how the narcissist thinks. So it must be you. And so this person uh, asked, well, does the narcissist flip the script? Yeah, they sure do. And they smile all the way. And then they, uh, when, when you don't receive what they have to say, uh, then it's like, yeah, see, you prove you're the problem. When in fact, it's like, I'm doing the best that I can. I'm pedaling as hard as I can. And, and still, whatever efforts I make are not enough. And then especially if I say, I'd like you to join me in my growth efforts, uh, that's, that's not going to get me anywhere good. Know what you're dealing with, know who your audience is, that person right there in front of you. Now, the, uh, the next question I have here, this person asks, uh, what's the difference between the narcissist alternate reality versus delusional thinking, or are they one and the same? And when you ask, well, what's the difference? The answer is words, uh, alternate reality, delusional thinking, same concept, different words to, to describe it. Um, I mentioned just a moment ago that the, that narcissists operate with this delusional idealism. Um, they, they really do think of themselves as deserving of everything that's wonderful and good. And they also think of themselves as being much healthier than they actually are. You know, for example, if they have a bad anger problem or if they uh, are uh, uh, highly defensive, all of that implies that deep down they're deeply insecure and they're in a panic mode when they do those kind of things. Uh, but instead of saying, you know, I got a problem here, what they do is this is the alternate reality. They just kind of make up truth, which is not true, but they make up their reality to suit uh, their narrative. And so it's delusional. So if they made a big, huge blunder, uh, whether it's inside their family or work or whatever it might be, relationships, uh, skills, eventually the alternate reality is going to come along and say, and they'll say something like, well, actually I had great intentions, but all these people around me were messing things up. And yes, I, I did make a mistake. They might go so far as to say, uh, say that if they're backed into a corner, but there's so many circumstances that really were the cause. It, it's really not about me. And so that's the alternate reality. Uh, they, they'll take the facts that are right there in front of them and they'll twist it around so that they come out looking good and somebody else is the fault. And you're over there saying, Hey, I'd like to grow with you. I'd like to team up with you so that we can be a better combination. And it's like, well, when their starting point is inaccuracy, when their starting point is justification of unhealthiness, it's not going to be a good team play at all. They're going to require you to come over to their side of the, uh, the ledger and their twisted thinking and knowing that to be the case, let's acknowledge that. And then let's move forward knowing that they're not going to join you. You have to individualize again. Okay. Sad, isn't it? All right. This next question, a person says I'm an adult child of alcoholism and dysfunction. And then the question is, why do I seek approval while at the same time I feel embarrassed and really dislike being publicly lauded or praised for something I've done? Now, I'm going to give you just a little um, clue as to how I think. Uh, as soon as someone says, I grew up in an alcoholic's family, my immediate reaction is, oh, so you didn't deal with emotional issues well. When we talk about a person who has these kind of uh, addictions, whether it's the painkillers or other kind of drugs or alcohol and things like that, basically you hear the term escapism very commonly associated with that. That individual who's addicted has decided rather than going straight forward and dealing with life and the, the realities that are in front of me today, <laughs> let's ignore that. I'm going to go uh, meet with my buddy, Jack, you know, Daniels, and I'm just going to have a good time with Jack. 
And, and so there's so much passive aggressiveness. There's ignoring, there's uh, kicking the can down the road. And so this person grew up in the dysfunction that, uh, that that represented. And so she says, uh, why do I seek approval? But then even if I get approval, I, I feel kind of embarrassed if somebody does pay me compliments, what's going on there. And, you know, you, you, you go back into your childhood and you think how many messages of negativity or invalidation or disdain or criticism did I receive? And probably the answer is lots. Or if there's neglect and there's just this lack of building up over time, that, that becomes your standard, that becomes your norm. And when someone comes along and says, I noticed something you did right. It's like, am I hearing that correctly? And it's not your norm. And, and so, so many times, if you've grown up in an alcoholic family or a narcissistic family, the, uh, the messages have been so deeply embedded in your brain that healthy messages sound foreign. Uh, by the way, tomorrow, and I, I hope you can get, a, get into this, I'm doing a checklist on narcissistic parenting. Uh, some of the most common things that narcissistic parents do that can follow you, and, and the message can follow you for uh, many, many years after you're uh, deep into your adult years. Uh, but basically, there's a brainwashing that goes along with being um, brought up by a narcissistic parent. And so uh, part of the brainwashing, keep in mind, means that they elevate themselves at your expense. And so later on as an adult, when you're not around that person and someone comes along and says, I I'd like to talk with you about the things that make good sense. It, it can just feel strange. Uh, you're, you're having to acclimate yourself to what I refer to as a different psychological language, the language of encouragement, the language of empathy. I remember so well when I was in graduate school, and I, I think I've used this illustration with you before. Uh, I was sitting in a uh, classroom and we were talking about how we were going to deal with children that would come into a playroom and we would uh, have a therapeutic intervention. And the professor, who became a dear friend of mine, uh, said, you know, what we need to do first and foremost is we want to establish a, uh, an atmosphere of freedom for that child to uh, feel like it's okay to come in and express themselves in whatever way they need. When I heard that word freedom, it, it's like uh, everything else shut down. I didn't hear a, a single word after that in the, in the lecture. And I just sat there, freedom as a child. Wow because I didn't really feel a lot of freedom as a child. And uh, I didn't really feel like I, it was okay for me to say, well, I feel this if it differed too much. And it, I was just enamored by that. And I had to ponder, what does that mean? And what are all the implications? So there are a lot of implications. And I had to restructure some of my thinking about uh, the privilege to choose and trusting in myself and gathering information as opposed to having to hurry up and give the correct answer because I was a doer, I was a achiever, I was a people pleaser way back when. And so when you grow up in a family system where you're constantly being told that's not enough or I don't care what you think or whatever, then as an adult, you realize, well, there are many different concepts besides what I was trained as, as a kid in. I need to figure out what that is. Give yourself permission to be a student of humanity, a student of yourself, a student of what is right and reasonable and logical and, and rational. And hopefully uh, some of those old messages can be replaced by much more well-conceived ideas of, uh, of psychological wholeness. Uh, I've been a student of human nature uh, since uh, late adolescence and as recently as yesterday, you know, reading on some things that will make me a better person and help me have a deeper understanding of the meaning of life. Uh, I've got a nice education. I've spoken with a lot of people and, uh, and I'm, I, I, I'm definitely determined to say, you know, even though I don't have it all figured out, uh, I'm going to continue to, uh, to learn. I hope that you can have that kind of resolve. And it's not so much that you have to get all the answers, but I'm just hoping you can get on the path, uh, on the trail toward answers and enjoy the process along the way. And when you make mistakes or old messages uh, pop back in your mind, don't be surprised or shocked, but just know that you're, you know, you're uh, a work in progress and you're going to keep leaning forward. 
I, I, I want you to have that uh, down to the core of my being. And then I want us to join together on that. That's what we mean when we say we're on Team Healthy Together. So I've got another person asked a question. Um, this person says, if someone gave me the silent treatment for several months, and then in parentheses, it says seven. So if someone gave me the silent treatment for seven months, but then apologized, for his actions when my dad died and then worked his way back into my life, but didn't change much for very long. Is that narcissism? And the answer is, Oh yeah. Yeah. We have terms for that. Uh, you, you have somebody that's selfish and entitled and uh, insensitive to you, a uh, lack of empathy. And that's part of narcissism. And finally, when you say, you know, this isn't working and that they just back off and go, go silent. It's like, Oh, good. The narcissist at that point is going to be thinking, uh, wait a minute. You used to be my narcissistic supply. In other words, I used to kind of count on you to, to feed me for whatever needs and, uh, and addictions I have, you know, the addiction for control and uh, the need for admiration, et cetera. Uh, I, I want you back. And so they, uh, they can think, well, I've got to get you back in my good graces so that I can have somebody who's going to prop me up. That's how they think. And so they have techniques. One of them, we call it hoovering. And when we talk about hoovering, they just try to suck you back in uh, to, uh, the, to the take over the, the job of being responsible for who they are. And, uh, and, and even if they've been abusive, it's like, well, I, I need to pull you back into your proper role, but then also they'll do what we call breadcrumbing. And when we talk about breadcrumbing, it's like, well, l let me make this good for you. And so they'll do favors for you, or they may pay compliments, or they, uh, they may uh, show an interest in things that you're interested in. Um, and, and so in, uh, in doing so it's like, well, if I can make this look good for you, like you're going to really gain by me being back in your life. Uh, that's going to work out really well. But keep in mind that these individuals suffer from emotional starvation. Uh, so that person has been out of your life for seven months and uh, good. Then you have a crucial thing that happened. Your own father dies. He comes to the funeral. And, uh, and you know, typically funerals uh, can prompt people in the audience to think, well, when it's my turn to be the one up there that everybody's talking about, am I going to give them enough material to work with? At least that's how I think when I go to a funeral, um, then, you know, it can, it, it can make you think, you know, I need to be a better person or I want to make sure that my legacy is something that is uh, something that is good and decent. So maybe he was thinking that way. Uh, but again, it's, it's more superficial and shallow. So it's like, Hey, you know, I, you and I, we really had something going on. Let's get back together. Let's be each other's best buds all over again. And without uh, the proper humility, the proper accountability and insight and awareness, they're going to go after they've hoovered you and after they've uh, breadcrumbed you, they're going to go straight back in the same old patterns. Uh, narcissists um, need uh, ongoing therapy. They need ongoing accountability. They need the feedback of other individuals. They need to know how to say, I, I blew it, or I was wrong, or help me understand. And most of them, if they do that, most of them won't even go that far, but if they do, it tends to be shallow. And so is that narcissistic? Yes. Okay. Uh, how about another question? Um, Dr. C, can you talk about self-sabotage? after narcissistic abuse. I'm having a hard time figuring out if I'm holding myself back from new opportunities because the old uh, undermining voices are playing out in my head or in, in my assessment of risks. Um, so here you have someone, it's like, you know, I, I'm doing my best to try to figure out how I can get beyond that. And there was a, a history of narcissistic abuse. That narcissistic individual may have been a rager or highly condescending or you know, constantly invalidating. And so as I put myself out there and I try my best to be that better person, I've got this thinking on the inside of my head that narcissist is in there. And I, I can't remember the titles of the videos, but I've got some videos on that topic. Um, and, and basically, that's an extremely common uh, pattern that we see. 
Now, there's really going to, I'm just going to give you sort of a general way of looking at uh, how you can move forward, knowing that's the case. One is, let's keep in mind that narcissists are not the, uh, the standard bearers that they think they are. They're not the ones that say, well, here's the truth and uh, it's, it's guaranteed to help you. I mean, they may say that, but uh, that when they make that proclamation, it's, it's not accurate. And so what you'll need to do, uh, and it's kind of going back to me when I was in graduate school and I heard that word freedom. Uh, and then there are many, many, many other things that I learned too. Uh, you want to pull back and ask, okay, in the good old days, here's what I used to think, but what do other people who, uh, whom I respect, what do they have to say? about my worth or about my uh, responsibilities or about my, uh, my decency and how to manage conflicts better or you know, how to communicate more cleanly or what uh, a good way to manage projects is. What do, what do I believe? And, uh, and when someone else comes along and says, well, you don't need to worry about that because I've already determined it for you. It's like, well, I, I'm not doing that anymore. And so you want to give yourself permission to think in terms of who you are, what your principles and values and standards are. And then second, as you're trying to make these kind of adjustments, it's good to make sure that you are aligned with people that you know and trust to be in a healthy growth trajectory themselves. And again, uh, the people that you look to as advisors or encouragers or fellow sojourners don't have to be perfect, but we do want them to be in that growth process. And so uh, it, it's a matter of exposing yourself to good thinking. And that's why I, I love to read. And uh, if, if there are any things like on the internet or things like that now that we have uh, that can be edifying in that regard, I, I, I'm going to soak it up. And then I want to be with people that I know are in the same growth mode. Uh, my wife, Jennifer, and I have uh, several uh, friends that <laughs> we just love being with them because yeah, there, there's a group of us that get together from time to time. It's almost like we joke. It's like no, this group therapy because we're honest with each other. And what a, what a delight and what a relief to know that there are people out there. So uh, you can feel like you're self-sabotaging because of a history of narcissistic abuse. The minute you say abuse and that other person is dishing it out, you want to remind yourself that's a very disturbed person who in their right mind would say abusing and diminishing another individual. That's a real successful way of doing life. That's somebody who has twisted logic. Uh, just know what, know what you're dealing with and then give yourself permission to rethink uh, what you believe is wisest and best. Uh, another an analogy. Um, uh, we uh, we have some people in France. I've heard from several of you there. Let, let's suppose, and the uh, reason I'm picking France is my, my mother's uh, maiden name was Guillebeau, uh, uh, Americanized Guillebeau. Uh, her ancestor was from Bordeaux, France, and they came over to the United States um, back in the, actually the late 1700s. And for a while, I'm assuming Andre Guillebeau, who was the uh, the first one that came over, he still spoke French. Uh, over time, uh, the Guillebeaux began to speak English, but you'd have to say, well, in French, it, it's this way, but in English, it, it, we say it that way. It takes time to learn a new language is where I'm going with that. And uh, most folks will say that uh, it, it takes a couple of years for it to become uh, first nature for you, where you're uh, speaking in that new language for quite some time. It's the same way when you're trying to learn new psychological languages. It's, it's, it's like uh, it, the olden ways we used to say it like this, but in the new language, we say it like this. And so, so much of your self-improvement efforts are learning a new psychological language of dignity, respect, and civility. And so give yourself permission to be a work in progress, like uh, you're still trying to learn that new language. And even if you have the new language, you may still uh, speak with the old uh, accent uh, in place. And so allow yourself that kind of privilege to, uh, uh, to be that kind of person. Okay. Now, another person asked something somewhat similar to this. Uh, this person says, could you talk about frozen emotions? I was taught to never cry or laugh. And then the analogy this person gives, you could cut off my arm and beat me with it, but I wouldn't cry. And I would say, well, let's not do that. But an act of compassion or kindness slays me. Only a small range of feelings 
uh, are allowed and I have no idea how to uh, be freed up from them. And so here we have another person. It's like, well, what I got was a big dose of negativity and uh, I, I, it was just too painful. It was too risky for me to even allow myself to feel my emotions. And so I couldn't be honest with myself about my hurt or my needs or uh, the, uh, the, the bitterness that might've been uh, building up on the inside of me. I just had to learn to ignore that. And that's the coping mechanism. And that's really sad. And then you've probably heard of the, the term, the Stockholm syndrome, where you wind up uh, picking up on the, the characteristics of the ones who are imprisoning you or holding you against your will. Uh, the Stockholm syndrome begins to kick in and it's like, well, I just guess the best way for me to get along is to just go with whatever they have uh, going on, the, my abuser. And then finally it's over. It's done. And you're now out there in the open world. And this person describes it as having frozen emotions. It's like, well, that became my norm. How do I get out from that? And uh, by the way, this is what we refer to as trauma bonding. Uh, when you're under another person's dominance and as a matter of survival, you just go along and do whatever you have to do so that they won't be any worse than it might be. Um, you want to remind yourself again, these people who are bringing this abusiveness to you are themselves terribly damaged. I mean, if I have to, hold someone down and in effect psychologically in prison or strip them of their dignity in order for them to like me and to go along with me. That's crazy. It, there's an insanity about that. The narcissist is not the gold standard. And so you want to try to remind yourself th this is just a person or a group of people, but not everyone thinks in this twisted kind of way. And so that's where your self-improvement, your education is, uh, is such an essential part of, of your own growth. And, and you know that I strongly encourage people to seek therapy or we have courses or there are all sorts of other kind of support groups that you can uh, get yourself involved with. Uh, don't just give lip service to saying I need to adjust, take the effort with people that can assist you and go in that path and be glad that the resources are there. Okay. But uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, the person who's abusing you is themselves psychologically damaged, which is why they uh, take that you know, inappropriate uh, response to you in the first place. <clears throat> Another uh, question. We have all sorts of terminology here when we talk about narcissism. This one uh, goes into the whole thing about gaslighting. Um, I, how can I know when my NPD husband is using gaslighting, contempt, sadistic, hateful kinds of comments, etc. My husband said the only reason I got married because was because everyone else was getting married. Then we ate cheap hamburger for our anniversary for years. So apparently she's referring to her husband who gaslights con and shows contempt, sadism, uh, hate and all the rest. How do I know if that's happening? Well, you just gave a pretty good list that identifies it right there. Uh, when a person is gaslighting you and, and holding you in that contempt, you're going to hear a lot of insults. Does that happen to you? You're going to be on the receiving end of plenty of criticism. Your decisions are going to be second guessed very consistently. You're going to be belittled. Uh, there's going to be a disregard for the pain that you feel that's generated by that narcissistic person. And somehow, if there continues to be a problem between that narcissist and you, it's your fault. That's how you know. And so again, I'm going to say, let's go back and, and uh, uh, ask the question now, who died and made that person king or who died and made that person queen? And the answer is nobody. And so it's like, okay, again, that's one person's uh, poorly informed uh, opinion. I get to be my own free person now. And uh, freedom means that you, you have the privilege to choose for yourself. And I'm going to listen to my own inner voice. Uh, you might want to look up, uh, uh, there's uh, a uh, video that I did. I think the title was something to the effect of your ultimate superpower when you're dealing with a narcissist. And that superpower is to learn how to trust in yourself. And frankly, it's one of my favorite videos. So if you haven't done that, uh, go and check that out. Um, these are individuals who 
when they keep coming at you with negativity, uh, they're more or less uh, giving you the message, hey, you're now getting, uh, you're on the receiving end of a lot of garbage. Just know it. Here it comes and prepare yourself. And at some point, it's, it's not just okay. It's of utmost necessity for you to say, nope, I'm not doing it. I'm, I'm going to remove myself from someone who tries to fill my brain with garbage thoughts and emotions. Please practice self-care and read the, uh, read the, uh, uh, the characteristics that are there uh, for the meaning that is, is behind it. Okay. Uh, another question um, is narcissism, just emotional immaturity. Can a narcissist change if they work on their emotional maturity? Well, the answer is yes. Narcissism is in fact, emotional immaturity. In fact, we talk about how they have arrested development. Many of them, you know, they can be 58 years old and they whine and gripe like a, a bully that's eight years old on the school ground. I mean, they, they, they really do show what I call pre-adolescent thinking. So is that emotional immaturity? Absolutely. Uh, can they change if they work on their emotional maturity? The answer is yeah. <laughs> the, the, the key word is if. And there, therein lies the problem. In order for a narcissist, or, or even you or me, if, if you're not a narcissist, in order to, to experience change, the first characteristic that we need to embrace is the characteristic of humility. Humility says, I know the world doesn't revolve around me. I get it. And I don't require that people give me all this special acclaim and treatment and all like that. Uh, I'm a work in progress. I, I, I do some things good. I don't do uh, other things the best. I, I can live with that. And then also uh, beyond humility, when you're trying to improve and change, you accept accountability. That, that is when people call you out instead of just kicking them in the shins. It's like, well, you're here to help me, I hope. Let me consider what you're having to say. And, um, and also when you uh, are trying to improve and change, uh, you don't just intellectualize about it. I've, I've spoken with many people who are kind of therapy junkies, but they're highly narcissistic and they can talk about Freud and Jung and Adler and all those guys. And they can really sound pretty smart, but the bottom line is they're still rude and they're still dismissive and they still don't know how to love. And so we don't want to just intellectualize about a change. We want to ask, well, what are some actionable ways that we can do this? You know, my, my sense of kindness or my service toward other individuals or establishing boundaries or managing myself uh, wisely in the midst of conflicts, those kind of things. And so again, um, can they change? Sure. If they, if they work hard enough, is it uh, highly pop probable? Not really because uh, their entitlement and egotism and uh, uh, manipulation and all is so strong. I mean, that's the defining feature of narcissism. <clears throat> and so just, again, know what you're dealing with. Uh, okay, we're, we're kind of out of time here, but um, let's go with one last question. Um, well, this is actually more of a comment. This was kind of an interesting one. This person says, doing marital work after death Seems unusual at first, but I'm learning it's necessary. So in other words, apparently this person says that narcissistic uh, person that I was married to has now died. And rather than saying good, just uh, riding off into the sunset, this person is saying, well, now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm apparently going to therapy or I have some uh, close confidants that I'm uh, entrusting my thoughts and feelings with. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out what was that all about? And I think that's an excellent way to move forward. Uh, one of the things that, you know, if you don't have a good sense of history, uh, then you're doomed to just continue to repeat the same mistakes that history uh, uh, gave to you. We need to know what our history is. Not that we're just going to obsess in it, but we need to know what kind of patterns and trends and uh, influences have been on the inside of us. And you've seen through some of these questions today that it can just stay inside your mind. If you're on a self-improvement track, it's like, well, I want to know what that is so that I can uh, very objectively and hopefully constructively make my own personal adjustments. And that's what we call growth. So what we're saying today is, yes, uh, stay on your path towards personal improvement. And when uh, the narcissist says, I don't want to reciprocate. I don't want to give back to you the good effort that you're giving towards yourself and the world. 
then it's like, okay, good to know. That means that you and I are not going to be close confidants. That means that I'm not going to draw heavily upon you to, to give me a good quality of life. I need to know that. I'm going to go towards individuals who can work with me because I, I don't want to be in any other direction. I'm on team healthy. I stand for dignity, respect, and civility. And the narcissist says, oh, yeah, me too. And then they don't show it. Or if they say, oh, it's just a bunch of garbage. Uh, okay, there you are. So let's stay in our growth trajectory. Let's stay on the path with one another. We're going to welcome anyone that wants to go along with us on that. I, I, I'm not going to hold that narcissistic person in hatred or contempt. There's a certain pity and compassion that I'm going to have. It's like, I'm so sorry that your life is such that you feel the need to diminish so many people. Uh, but I, I can't afford to uh, uh, to invest anymore in someone who refuses to uh, to grow with me. So I hope this gives you some good insight and awareness. I absolutely love this format because it allows me to know you more fully. And, and by the way, whenever I get these comments and questions, uh, uh, a, a lot of them become fuel for future videos. So I draw inspiration from uh, learning from you. I hope you have a good rest of the week. And I'll see you next Wednesday with our midweek with Dr. C. And, and put your questions below. I look forward to hearing from you. Bye.